I did introduce Michael last night, but for those who weren't here, uh, listening to David this morning, the full import of the word scholar dawned upon me, and I think the rest of us, of what it really means. And here is another scholar. Uh, no, to you I'm talking about. Yes, I get my money later, will I? Yes. Um, here's another scholar of theosophy, and an author, and uh, a historian of, of uh, uh, more than theosophical repute in, in the world. And uh, it's Michael's task this, um, in this four days to um, cement together what the other speakers are talking about. And of course he, he, has, he has the perfect mixture and uh, 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 ingredients uh, of to do that, and that is the secret doctrine itself. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Harold. This will be the first of four sessions on a series called The Secret of the Secret Doctrine. Voila. I know you're applauding for her, not me. <laughs> uh, earlier on this year, I was at a conference in Los Angeles, in California, and they had a panel on the secret doctrine. And one of uh, two words kept coming up at this panel about the secret doctrine. Difficult and study. It was a difficult book and a book that you study. And I asked them, I said, when you are very, very hungry, do you sit down to a meal and say, this is a difficult meal? <laughs> when you are in love, let me give some of you a few minutes to remember what that's like. When you are in love, do you say, it's difficult. It's, I'm going to study this relationship. Of course not. When you are truly interested in something, it really isn't difficult. So we are going to use these sessions as a chance to experience the secret doctrine. I really want you to experience it. Uh, you have such excellent speakers at this year's summer school that I don't have to tell you, they will be doing that job for me. But I want us to really experience what <coughs> this book is about. I think each generation gets the secret doctrine they deserve. Now, I'll be quoting HPV to you a lot. And she says that before the pupil can be taught, he must learn how to conduct himself as regards the world, his teacher, the sacred science, and his inner self. Before the pupil can be taught, he must learn how to conduct himself as regards the world, his teacher, the sacred science, and his inner self. Now, what does she mean by that? Uh, I'll give you an example from the Upanishads, the sacred scriptures of India. In the Chandogya Upanishad, they start with a tale about Prajapati, the lord of the world, is chanting this hymn the self that is free from evil, free from old age and death, free from sorrow, free from hunger and thirst, that is the self that you should seek to perceive. When someone discovers that self and perceives it, he obtains all the worlds and all his desires are fulfilled. And it goes on to say that 
the devas and the asuras, the devas are, of course, the gods, and the asuras are usually translated as demons. The asuras always get a bad rap, so to speak, right? But yet they are necessary for the cosmic balance. For instance, when the gods needed the uh, amrita, the nectar of immortality, they were going to churn the ocean of milk. So they wrapped this giant serpent around a mountain, and the gods on one side and the asuras on the other, and churned the ocean to bring up uh, the nectar of immortality. So the gods and the asuras heard this and went to Prajapati and said, well, let's discover this thing because whoever obtains the self obtains the world. And Prajapati then instructs them and they, he says, so they ask, what is this self? What is this self that we are questing? And Prajapati says, well, put on your best clothes and look into the mirror. And they see, of course, resplendent, divine. He says, the self you see in the mirror, that is the self. And the gods and the asuras left. The asuras went on and, of course, lived a life for the self they saw, the self they perceived. They went on and ate, drank, and be merry, so to speak. But Indra, the king of the gods, as he went on, he realized that the self you see in the mirror also changes. It is not always resplendent. It's sometimes sick, it's sometimes unhappy. So he goes back again to Prajapati and tells him this. And so Prajapati then instructs him and says, well, the self you see in dreams, that is the true divine self. And Indra again goes away and then realizes but that self you see in dreams, sometimes your dreams are always not nice. You, it cannot be the desirable thing. Of course, he goes back again. The story keeps continuing, so Prajapati tells him, the self, when you are totally dreamless sleep, that is the self. But then Indra realizes, in dreamless sleep, you don't perceive anything. You're just a clod. So finally, of course, at the end, uh, Prajapati gives him the instruction about the divine self, the self that is free from evils, uh, the self that you should discover, that is the self. This idea of how you approach a subject, I think, is very telling. Most of us will approach theosophical literature or something like the secret doctrine. We should ask ourselves, why? What do we want to get out of it? Because what you seek from something, your motive, will decide the outcome. Is it because, well, it's the theosophical thing to do, everyone else is studying it? What do you really want to get out of the book? Do I really just want knowledge? Do I want to learn all of these intricate theories of life? And HPB again gives some in examples of in the school she belonged to the requirements that are necessary and I'll just give you briefly some of them. For instance, the place selected for receiving instruction must be a spot calculated not to distract the mind. The five sacred colors gathered in a circle must be there. The decide before the disciple can be permitted to study face to face, he has to study with other disciples. This is one of the things that is specifically her ideas, that you study with a group. It's not just individual study. We are not just individual studying. But by studying with a group, as she says, which are not of your own choosing, then you also, by the very act of working out these difficulties, something else happens. Um, the disciples have to be attuned in harmony to each other. Um, the, a, a disciple has to dread external living influences alone. For this reason, while one with all in his inner self, he must take care to separate his outer body from every foreign influence. None can drink out of his or eat from his own uh, vessels. He must avoid bodily contact with human beings. If you go to India, you know this is the greeting. It isn't the handshake or the physical touching. 
Uh, she even elaborates and she says, for instance, no pet animals are permitted and it is forbidden even to touch certain trees and plants. A disciple has to live, so to say, in his own atmosphere. Uh, no animal food of whatever kind, nothing that has life in it, no wine, no spirits, no opium should be used. And the reasoning she gives that you shouldn't eat meat is that in eating meat you absorb the psychic quality of the animal. It's nothing about you're killing an animal. As she says, meditation, abstinence, the observance of moral duties, gentle thoughts, good deeds, and kind words, as goodwill to all and entire oblivion to self, are the most efficient means of obtaining knowledge and preparing for the reception of higher wisdom. The preparing for the reception of higher wisdom. So if we approach something like the secret doctrine, that we approach any book or a textbook, how are we preparing for this reception of higher wisdom? And of course, as she points out, these rules are almost impossible for people living in the West. How can you go about in daily life without even physical contact with anyone? Someone pats you on the back and then what do you do? So she says, these, so these are the conditions, but they're really very, very difficult for those of us living in the West. So how then do we, what is the preliminary, the prerequisite for approaching this teaching? So we just don't pick up a book and read it from cover to cover. And this is the problem I think people have. They pick it up and they expect to understand it. You know, we really want understanding. E equals mc squared. We want things to have a meaning. And of course, a lot of things in the secret doctrine don't have a meaning or a logical meaning that we understand, nor should it. If this is truly, if you take the book as what it says it is, if these are the meditations of seers, of generations of seers, what was their purpose in, first of all, recording these teachings? They certainly didn't just record it so people could have a study group or that. There's an interesting quote from C.W. Leadbeater that about the secret doctrine. He says that this is what he was told by older students when he joined. He said, he was told that it was not a history, but a series of directions, rather a formula for creation than an account of it. We approach the secret doctrine and we think it's telling us some events that are happening, the creation of the world. But yes, that's one level of interpretation. As Madame Levesque herself points out, there are seven different keys of interpretation. There are seven different ways of looking at this text. So as a preliminary, I'll give you again a quote from her. I discovered it in a little notebook of hers in uh, the archives of Adyar. It really hadn't been published. It's a little, she had these little notebooks that she would make her comments in. And she actually put the heading of this as truth and accuracy. And she says, an eminent man of science once called my attention to the distinction necessary to be made between truth and accuracy. A person may be truthful, that is to say, may be filled with the desire both to receive truth and to teach it, but unless that person have great natural powers of observation or have been trained by scientific study of some kind to observe, note, compare, and report accurately and in detail, he will not be able to give a trustworthy, accurate, and therefore true account of his experiences. His intentions may be honest, but if he have the spark of enthusiasm, he will be apt to proceed to generalizations which may be both false and dangerous. And I think a lot of not only theosophical history but studies in this area, there are a lot of generalizations which may be both false and dangerous. So how then do we approach the preliminary? If this is a sacred text, and like all sacred texts, even in India, how do you prepare 
to approach this, right? As she says, so I, I suppose one of the very first things is the ability to focus the mind, to be able to concentrate. I work in a, a library and one day a lady came in and she said she wanted me to recommend a book she could read while watching television. <laughs> and I, but you laugh, but I think this is how our minds work. In, in the Tibetan tradition, they talk about discursive thought, which we know the mind is constantly thinking. And of course, as David has pointed out and will point out in the rest of his talks, you see I am precognition of this. Manas, this wonderful word, mind, is truly the faculty that is present among us. Mind, the constant thinking, the constant... In modern philosophy, actually, sentence structure, how we think, how a sentence is put together, thought itself, is a great example of how the mind works. But in Eastern philosophy, they also talk about non-discursive thought, which is, so the mind is there thinking, but then you may quiet the mind, but there is another level where a non-discursive, non-linear form of thought is going. Probably to understand this, it's a way like a computer works. A computer is working, and if you have a virus, it may slow down your computer, and you may not even be aware of it. Things st a program is running, yet you may think you only have this going. There's a non-discursive thought. So how do we approach this? Not like the lady who wanted the book to read while she's watching television. And I'm not denying that other forms are useful or valid, but how you approach the subject. And HPV points out that the secret doctrine, the stanzas in the secret doctrine, are part of a series, as she points out, in the voice of the silence is also part of this similar type of material that is given to students. And the first line in the voice of the silence is that these instructions are for those ignorant of the dangers of the lower idi, the lower mind, the psychic faculties that are constantly going. And then so how do you then approach this? She tells us that the mind is the great slayer of the real. The mind is constantly interpreting, constantly analyzing. And this is not a bad thing because we have, point, we have spent millennia, as David pointed out with the races, developing, coming to a state where mind can be developed. But as theosophists, we, as we have a specific task for us. We must now take the next step and develop that which is beyond mind, or the fruit of mind, which is intuition. How do you then develop that intuition? Both HPB and all the great philosophers, Plato, you know, Plato's theory of knowledge is, you already know everything. It's there, and all knowledge is a recollection of what you know. But you have to be receptive enough. You have to be able to focus on the ability to let that knowledge come through. And as we continue with this series, we will probe perhaps a little deeper. As she says in the Voice of the Silence right at the beginning, uh, the dis let the disciples slay the slayer. And how do you do that? But you develop this function called dharana. Right? And she says, dharana is the intense and perfect concentration of the mind upon one interior object. So when we truly study, when we focus, right, we are actually practicing that form of yoga. When we read something that we are so engrossed in, we lose track of time. That's an example of us being able to focus. But when we read something and we really are not interested and we read a free lines and then think, well, oh, on Thursday I have to do this, oh, and yes, I have something else to do, the mind is always interrupting us. So. We will, in this series, and I'm sure through the other speakers also, approach this most wonderful of all things, our most wonderful inheritance as theosophists, that focusing, that ability to analyze, to be receptive to these ideas. Now, one of the closest cognates 
to the stanzas of Xi'an in The Secret Doctrine. And in fact, HPB puts it on the opening page, is this great hymn of creation from the Vedas, Mandala 10, 129. And I'll read it through, and this will prepare you for this understanding of the material we will be looking at during this series, the hymn of creation. There was not the non-existent nor the existent then. There was not the air nor the heaven which is beyond. What did it contain? Where? In whose protection? Was there water unfathomable, profound? There was not death nor immortality then. There was not the beacon of night nor of day. That one breathed windless by its own power. Other than that, there was not anything beyond. Darkness was in the beginning hidden by darkness. Indistinguishable, this was all water. Matter, right? Primeval matter. That which coming into being was covered with the void, that one arose through the power of heat this concentration. Desire in the beginning came upon that, desire that was the first seed of mine. Sages seeking in their hearts with wisdom found out the bond of the existent in the non-existent. I always love that particular phrase. It's so beautiful. Sages seeking in their hearts with wisdom found out the bond of the existent in the non-existent. I think that's just such beautiful poetry. Their cord was extended across. Was there below? Was there above? There were impregnators, there were powers. There was energy below, there was impulse above. Who knows truly? Who shall declare whence it has been produced? Whence is the creation? By the creation of this universe, the gods come afterwards. Who then knows how it has arisen? Whence this creation has arisen, whether he founded it or not, he who in the highest heaven is, is its surveyor, he only knows, or else he knows not. So this is the question. How do we even know? The stanzas tell us about the creation of the universe. But how do we know this fact when nothing existed? When even supposedly in mythologies the gods didn't exist? How did these sages, probing in their hearts with wisdom, find this knowledge of creation when te technically nothing was created? The universe is nothing else existed. How did they perceive this? I'm going to give you a lot of, I shall give you more questions than answers. Um, but it's interesting that HPB has already prepared the reader in Isis Unveiled. In her first book, she has already uh, given some examples of uh, the secret doctrine. For instance, she says, and she actually uses in Isis Unveiled, which is 10 years before the publication of the secret doctrine, the term secret doctrine, but not as the book. Uh, she says that, uh, I will give you an example. Esoteric philosophers held that everything in nature is but a materialization of spirit. The eternal first cause is latent spirit, they said, and matter from the beginning. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, quoting gospel. While conceding the idea of such a God to be an unthinkable abstraction to human reason, they claimed that the unerring human instinct grasped it as a reminiscence of something concrete to it, though intangible to our physical senses. With the, with the first idea, which emanated from the double-sexed and hidden to inactive, inactive deity, the first motion was communicated to the whole universe, and the electric thrill was instantly felt through the boundless space. 
spirit begat force, and force matter. And thus the latent deity manifested itself as a creative energy. This last line really sums up the first volume of the secret doctrine. Spirit begat force. Now what is the difference between spirit and force, I ask you? And force matter. Thus the latent deity manifested itself as a creative energy. So this universe that we see around us, this whole existence, is not, of course, a random series of atoms or is dead matter, which was very prominent in her, her time, but a living, vibrant being, creative energy. Right? This is this wonderful thing. Imagine, imagine yourself as creative energy, that you have at the basis of your being, your own true nature is that creative, divine energy. And then ask yourself, then, why did you create all of this universe? Why did you create this world? To be unhappy? To suffer? To worry about taxes? No. no, right? Because truly, each of us has that unlimited divine potential. And one of the things when you go through the stanzas, it's a, you get a shift of consciousness. Esoteric texts function very differently than our regular texts, any regular book. They can be a literal interpretation, so what you are reading is the creation of the universe and those sort of things. It can be symbolical, it can be allegorical, or by the very interacting with that text, you have some substantive change in your consciousness. Now, that change may not be recognizable to you or instantaneous, you're not suddenly going to change enlightenment, but a process starts occurring. The great Tibetan teacher Sankapa says there are two things necessary for the spiritual life, two prerequisites, and that is leisure and opportunity. Until you have the ability of leisure, of being able to come to events like this, and the opportunity. That, then, is the basis of it. If you are constantly working and have no time for this, if you are constantly working and worried about just simply day-to-day -day existence, feeding yourself, think of all the multitudes of this planet. You are the favored shoe through of this whole thing. The majority of people in this planet who slave and work, who travel hours just to get water, who live in a subsistent living. You are truly the crown of creation, right? And by approaching these ideas, you in turn are truly affecting the consciousness of the universe. David brought up a very important point about our own self-consciousness. The whole universe has developed through us to understand, to know itself. And then also to learn how to interact, how to treat each other. That is truly the greatest of all things, to learn how to live among each other. As you know, the basis of HPV's teaching, the final thing she tells us, she tells us that there are two paths to enlightenment, where you can simply attain enlightenment and become a Prajika Buddha, and, you know. But just as this, the voice of the silence says, can there be bliss when all that lives must suffer? Shall thou be saved and heal the whole world cry? No, of course not. Her own path is you attain all of this to be able in turn to help others who are not as fortunate as you. And so don't ever say to yourselves, oh, I don't know this, I can't understand this. Then you are just building your own limitations. Of course you know it, of course you understand it. You just have to give that process a chance to express itself. But as nature around us shows, a plant doesn't a seed does not plant be planted and suddenly develop into a tree. All things take time. And in this process, of course, we learn the understanding. And they have a saying in America, getting there is half the fun. Right? Through actually the process of treading, of understanding these things, 
it's not so much the achievement of the goal, but by treading the path, you know, thou canst not travel on the path until thou hast become that path itself. So those of you who have the wonderful opportunity to attend something like the Euro School, uh, which truly is so different than other theosophical groups, but any other theosophical group, you are particularly with some particular perspective, let us say. But in the Euro School, we truly draw from all over. And we have a wonderful chance to share. I think part of the lectures are part, but as you well know, a, the things that we take away from the Euro School are, is all the interactions, the, the talking, the discussing, the laughter, you know, the, the truly most wonderful things. So we finally learn to understand somebody and respect them for themselves, right? So we'll uh, just take a break here, not, not a musical break <coughs> or a drinking break. Uh, the break is for me to stop talking and you to start talking. So I will open it up to questions. And I certainly have not come all this way for us to sit in a room in silence. That was meditation. So yes, are you fanning or asking? Fanning, fanning. <laughs> any, any questions? Or you just are all perfectly understood everything? Are all Buddhas in, in embryo? Yes. You said something about each generation getting the self, uh, secret doctrine they deserve. Could you explain that? Not so much an individual book. For instance, we talk about the ancient wisdom, right? This is something that perennial teaching. In the Renaissance, they called it the Priscia Theologica, the perennial philosophy. This tradition through European thought is now really beginning to be recognized, especially on the academic level. Of course, in the Netherlands, you can get a degree in study, you can get an MA and a PhD in the study of Western esotericism. And this uh, Sorbonne has had that program for years. So there is a recognition of this primeval teaching. In Eastern traditions, it's always been there. Uh, unlike the West, that has been marginalized, right? It became esoteric, occult, hidden, just simply to survive. In the East, esoteric doesn't mean something underground. Esoteric means a level of proficiency. So it's a more detailed teaching than the ordinary person is interested in. So each, so in turn, so otherwise we would still be studying the Vedas or any other ancient text. In each time, in each age, this material is restated for our understanding. The secret doctrine truly is remarkable because as has been pointed out, it is the first attempt, the first time that esotericism had to also deal with science, deal with modern science. And if you really look in the book, you will see that she does cite Darwin. She does not only his two books, she discusses other scientists. So each generation gets that restatement of the teaching that it deserves or needs. Uh, in the 19th century, the way they studied this book, if you look at the transactions of the Rovatsky Lodge, it was all about data, all about stuff. You know, the 19th century was the age of conquest. People really mapped out the world. They learned stuff. And so people wanted to know about stuff. Yeah. They wanted to know about the things. Uh, Emily Sullen, who uh, my library in New York is named after because she endowed it, referred to it as the machinery of the secret doctrine as opposed to the, metaf the metaphysics, the big picture, uh, as opposed to all the little nitty details. What does this mean in Fohat? And that, you know, we want some logical explanation. But truly, this book does function on a level that we really don't quite understand. When you meditate, how do you say you understand the process that happens? Is it something you know? But it comes by, of course, first stilling the mind and then allowing that inner self, that uh, divine part of you, to uh, express itself. Is that any help? No. Yes. Thank you. yes. Um, 
We've also got an MA in Western Eastern Terrorism. Yes, yeah, so in the University of Exeter. Yes. Um, I was interested, Mike, in what you had to say about um, intuition. It's something I've been speaking to a number of people about since uh, I've been here. Um, I mean, it is being said by a great many people, um, such as the Institute of Noetic Sciences and others in the States, that this idea of intuition, this change in consciousness, is becoming quite fundamental and is actually gaining traction and some sort of momentum at the moment now. Um, is that something that you perceive and is that something that uh, you believe is going on around you? I would say certainly, but again, I always question and ask then, what do you mean by intuition? What do you mean by intuition? How would you define intuition? Well, I, I guess when a, a kind of a Gnostic process without the filters, where it's a kind of a direct line in some sort of way without rationalism, without preconceptions, without um, a superstructure being added to it already. And so I, you, I, you know, I especially look at the great changes. HPB said in the last quarter of each century there is a greater attempt or an outpouring of these ideas. If you really look at the last quarter of the 20th century, there really has been a radical shift in consciousness. A lot of these ideas that you could only get through groups like the Theosophical Society are now broadcast. I mean, they're in all parts, karma, reincarnation, they're part of common parlance, you know. All of those ideas are out there, and so we really then have to ask, what is the work of the Theosophical Society? You know, to an extent, our success has been the cause of our own failure, because our ideas are all out there. Now, what do we do? You know, what is the nature of our work for this particular period. Uh, the idea of a sixth sense truly is truly developing, but uh, I think especially even the young today, they intuitionally know all these things. You know, they don't have to come and sit to a lecture. You know, look at the development of the green movement in the, in the idea that what you do can have an effect and have a global effect. This was something you really didn't find before, say, the 60s. This idea, you know, that what you do, each individual can make a process, have a part in changing the world. Before, it was governments who changed the world, it was leaders who changed the world. Now, of course, it's all on what you do. And, of course, that great American philosopher, Michael Jackson, has said, I'm starting with the man in the mirror. I'm asking him to change his ways, right? It's the, you know, you laugh, but they also have really actually quite profound ideas that in turn have just broadcast all over the world. So yes, of course, intuition is the next step, but again, what we really have to probe deeper. One of the great things that uh, has been given to the Theosophical Society, Adyar, is Krishnamurti. And as you know, a lot of his ideas is simply then questioning, what do you mean by this? How do you know these things? Do you simply accept ideas and go along blindly parroting words? A, pr a deeper probing. When you have a dialogue, it is different than a discussion or a debate. A debate or a discussion is you're trying to convince somebody to your point of view. Krishnamurti spent all of his life in a dialogue, and I think he got as much out of his talks as the people he were talking to because it was a constant probing, a constant deeper understanding of things. Don't all speak at once. Come, come. Yes. Uh, we have a, in London a, a secret doctrine class yes. on a Tuesday night and uh, it's very interesting that this is obviously open to everyone and somebody's seen the internet and have come along to it and it's, uh, it's always a challenge where you're sitting there and you're on page 390 and somebody comes in for the first time and you know and it's interesting you somebody will say at the end of it for instance that was great absolutely loved mm. it you know didn't understand a word of it but it, it was you know and, it, and in that way it was an allowance a sort of way of relaxing back and allowing this to sort of wash over you opposed to other people who want an answer there and then a very direct sort of line and it's really this sort of how that is introduced if you like we all have different experiences of approaching the secret doctrine but it's how we would somebody who came in off the street if you like to how would you suggest they would sort of start 
taking that on board. Get my book. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I would highly recommend that we start with this, which is the heart and essence of the, the it is the secret of the secret doctrine. It's not just, uh, you know, there have been previous abridgments, which were just shriveled versions mm -hmm. of the book. You know, it's like those nutritious drinks, like a wheatgrass drink, which is supposed to be good for you, but tastes horrible because it's so condensed. Uh, you know, the great Indian philosopher, Shankaracharya, has said in his own philosophy that even the Vedas are not telling you about the act of creation, but really turning your attention to the absolute. All of these words, all of these philosophies are turning your attention to think about the unthinkable. All of our life is on this mundane world. And when you get to something like the secret doctrine, it really is a shift in consciousness because you are not looking up at the divine, but seeing it as the divine does, looking down into the whole aspect of creation. Uh, you mentioned London. Many years ago, I spoke there, and a lady came up in the seats, an elderly lady came up, and immediately fell asleep. Slept through the entire lecture, and at the end came up to me and said, that's one of the best talks I've ever heard. <laughs> and, and no doubt it was for her. And I thank you. Um, I once sat in a secret doctrine class in London when Tony Maddock was still doing it. And they were, of course, laboriously reading page by page by page by page. And Sometimes there were more people, sometimes there were less. And at this particular one, just a handful of people, but a young lady in the class, she came in and she first announced before the class, she said, this is probably the last class I'm coming to. She said, why does everything in this book supposed to mean something else? Right? So Tony being Tony, they were simply reading through, I think it was about snakes and the, and, and, uh, the trees and all that. So we're reading through. And, you know, they're going around, each person read something. And when she read her part, she said, oh, so that means such and such. She had that aha moment that we didn't. Suddenly, something had relevance to her and spoke to her. So you never know where, when the divine will speak to us, when we will be caught unawares, right? We're treading among the divine. Uh, one of the things, well, if you stick through the next three, you'll, I'll, I'll give you perhaps more of that answer because I think the previous approach has been a brain-mind approach and I would like to see the secret doctrine used more as a meditation text. This version is not so much a book for the mind but a book for the heart. Uh, many, many years ago when I was in India, my friends kept saying, oh, you have to go hear this Swami so-and-so, and even though they were Parsis. And I wasn't really interested in hearing, but he came to Madras and I went to see him, a very elderly man with long hair, thousands of people there. And he said, one of the things he said is, the mind should be empty and the heart should be full, but instead the heart is empty and the mind is full. Right? And as you know, with a lot, even going back to in the Christian Western things, it's all about emptying the self, emptying out of to let the divine come in. A lot of Christian mysticism is about emptying out yourself so the divine bridegroom, the divine can come in. Uh, to realize that you do have at the basis to understand, to be able to recognize that divinity in you. Perhaps divinity isn't the right word, but our language is such that each of us has that divine spark, that wonderful electric thrill that is spent through life. And really all of our teachings is simply to recognize that in us. You know, that, you know, oh hidden life vibrant in every atom, oh hidden light shining in every creature. To recognize that unity, that commonality, really can help uplift all of humanity. Uh, just in closing, I'll give you a, one of the ideas. I came across this light idea about the secret doctrine of all people, Catherine Tingley. She, when at the end of her uh, leadership, I suppose, she had a series of lectures done by Gottfried Perucker. And when he, after giving his first two, unfortunately it's not in his printed book, it's just in the little off print that they did on the three fundamentals. She said, she said that <coughs> what, it is not that we need to get anything new 
but we need to make active that which we, we, that which we possess. Not that we really need further extensions of the teachings and something new. We haven't even understood the basic teachings. So it's not that we really need anything new, but we meet, need to make active that which we possess. And I think that's a great idea, and that's what I'm going to leave you to, to digest that uh, as you will digest your meal. So uh, thank you so much, and we will continue, well, we will continue our voyage of discovery with the secret doctrine. Thank you. Mm -hmm.